Hi, everybody. Hello, hello, hello. Deep breaths. It is almost Passover. It is officially the busiest, most challenging week on the Jewish calendar. As we close out a quarter, if you're a businessman or woman, as we go into Passover and clean, prepare, cook for our families, I want to know how you're feeling, where you're watching from. I'm going to speak to our producer now, Adam, and ask him to please put comments up on the screen so we can just kind of take your temperature and see where you guys are at, what you've, what you've accomplished, what you've crossed off your list, what's still on your list. Um, I'm celebrating the small wins. I got the wine. I have all the stuff for the Seder plate. I got my dress for the Seder. Um, but <laughs> if you can believe it, I still haven't cooked yet. I'm um, doing still a lot of cooking demos this week from my kitchen. I did. I just did a four ingredient Seder, um, which you guys can catch also if you just kind of scroll down on the feed and lots of other fun things. I just did the Today Show two days ago, uh, lots of Passover recipes, but everything was cooked on my set. So nothing is kosher for Passover. My set I, I is not kosher for Passover. So after I kind of wrap up this is my last live and I'm really excited for this week's episode of Feed Your Soul. I will close down the studio uh, kitchen and the set here and go into my house and start cooking for Passover. So this episode is so exciting to me. I'm a, a lot obsessed with our next guest. Reading her story brought chills um, to my entire body. I became so emotional when I heard, when I learned just more about her. Her cooking is fantastic, but her story is even as equally as unbelievable. So before I bring her on, I'm just going to give you a little bio. The first generation American daughter of Belarusian immigrants, Bonnie Frumkin Morales, is an author and the chef co-owner of Kachka in Portland, Oregon, widely considered the best Russian restaurant in the United States. Bonnie Re Morales was named one of Tasting Table's new originals and nominated for Food and Wines, the People's Best New Chef in 2015. In 2018, Morales was named a Rising Star Chef by Star Chefs and a finalist for the James Beard Award for Best Chef Northwest. Morales' first cookbook, Kachka, A Return to Russian Cooking, was released in 2017 to critical acclaim. I'm so excited to welcome Chef Bonnie Morales. Yay, buddy! <laughs> we always like, you know, like hold our breath, you know, is the guest. I mean, we were on, obviously, we tested this backstage, but is she coming? We have technical difficulties. What's going on? I'm so happy you're here, Bonnie. How are you today? I'm great. I'm so happy to be here. So thank you for having me. Um, this is actually, Passover is one of my favorite times of year to cook for. And um, so I'm just excited to share a little bit with you. We have so much to get into, but we always like to start the show off with some cooking. So you're making chremzalach, which is how I pronounce it. And I saw written, you did it with a K. Um, so it, am I pronouncing it correctly? You know, from your background, how, how is it pronounced? Yeah, it, you know, it's so funny actually that you mentioned that because in English, when you transliterate uh, Hebrew, you always do CH, like Hanukkah, right? Yeah. But when you transliterate yeah. the same sound in Russian, it's KH. So like holoditz is a Russian dish that if you were doing it like Hebrew-y, it would be C-H-O-L, right? right? But in um, in Russian, when scholars translate, whatever, the people in charge of this sort of stuff, they always do K-H. <laughs> so sometimes I write it with the K-H and some H with the C-H. And it's also a lot of the people in my restaurant um, aren't don't have a Jewish background or a Russian background. And so if I do C-H, they might say tremzlach, you know? And so like chocolate. Just to kind of help. Yeah, <laughs> <Right. So laughs> totally. I know. I know. Help the everyone out a little bit. Yep. But so yeah. my grandfather always make made this, and so tell us your recipe and show yeah, it to so us. Like, get get it going. Talk yeah, and cook. let's get it going. So um, we uh, this is something that I uh, was talked through by my parents because it's not something they ever made, but it's something they remember their parents making. Um, and it starts with matzo meal soaking in water, which I did ahead of time because you needed to sit for a little bit to hydrate and you don't want to watch that sit for 30 minutes. So I pre-did that. And then um, we have a, uh, we use uh, duck confit. So um, that's duck that's been salted and then cooked low and slow in duck fat and it preserves it. Um, we use that at the restaurant already. So it's just uh, something that's easy to, um, to have on hand. And we're also going to have- I feel like Bonnie, onions. chefs yeah. love duck confit. And I yeah. love duck fat. I feel like it's like a culinary, you know, secret. It's not something that I think is so easy to replicate at home. Although it's not so hard, but it's a little bit more foreign to the home cook. But why is it like such a love and treasure to real chefs? 
Well, there's so much flip. So first of all, all that fat obviously um, keeps things nice and moist. Um, so that's always welcomed. But then also there's so much flavor whenever you put anything low and slow and salting it preserves it. So you end up with this thing that's um, basically always ready um, uh, at your table or um, in your, in your uh, larder, you could say. I mean, people keep in the refrigerator covered over fat. Looks like I missed a bone there. Um, and then... Um, it's just always ready. I will say that, um, so the recipe that my parents described involved uh, take, so in, in their tradition, uh, grivinkis are um, uh, the duck fat or goose fat with a little bit mm -hmm. of the meat still attached. Um, uh -huh. and, and then that gets pan fried and it's, it's usually not crispy, crispy. A lot of people in the U S think that it's supposed to be like pork rinds where it's like crunchy. Yes. Um, and my understanding is that it's actually not, it's actually sauteed and sort of like fried, but still soft. And so essentially mm -hmm. this was supposed to be gribinkis. Um, but for us, we, you know, and sometimes we do have places to use other parts of that duck where we would have just trimmed the fat with the top layer of skin, but we don't always have that. So um, sometimes we need to um, sometimes we need to um, switch it up, and this is the most sort of like this is for me the easiest thing to replicate anywhere because a lot of if you if you're not willing to do duck confit um, at home, a lot of uh, nicer grocers carry it too. So it's something you can get if you don't want to deal with it. But you can easily right. do the same exact thing, like I said, with any part of the duck or goose, with just making sure there's a good amount of the skin attached, um, and okay, if you're great. going to do it from raw it doesn't really change anything because we're not what we're going to do next is we're going to saute some of the onions that i've chopped up because it's about a quarter of an onion here with my diced up duck um that has the, like i said that you want the skin so as much of the skin yes. uh, to the to the duck that you can get um, it's a crazy flavor that you're building here in this pan when you com com combine those onions and that duck i right. saw you started a little bit of oil in the pan bonnie is that olive oil uh, I just grabbed whatever oil was handy. I always have sunflower okay. oil. Um, okay. That's just, again, Russian, Ukrainian, Belarus, all, all the sort of central, like Russian and central Russia, and actually down into Georgia. That's sort of the primary oil used. It's sort of the olive oil of that region. So mm -hmm. I like to stay true to my roots in that way. And so I've actually recently basically like kept olive oil out of my kitchen, but only like that's just very personal and nobody else has to go that far. <laughs> um, it's really just any cooking oil. Um, well, you don't become the best Russian restaurant in the entire United States without just keeping it, you know, true to the roots. So we appreciate that that tidbit because I actually didn't know that. You know, my parents are born in Transylvania, so I like you, I'm first generation American. So there's some similarities overlapping in that yeah. Eastern European space, but I didn't know that about the oil. So I love learning that. Yeah, it's really funny that that has that's something that doesn't come up very often. But um, if you actually travel to the region and you go to markets and stuff, you'll actually see like women in a lot of these places uh, come to market with their own freshly pressed oils, uh, sunflower oils, oh. and you can actually taste like one woman's oil to the next um, is totally different flavor. It just has to do with the seeds that they're using. And here, yeah. that sort of level of scrutiny and like sort of artisanship with sunflower oil is never even discussed. Um, it's seen a little bit more as a commodity and often you only find the really, really refined stuff. And yeah. there it's just like transportive because you have all these like very specific flavors of sunflower oil and some are roasted more and some are roasted less. And um, it's just amazing. So if you ever make your way back to that region of the world, I definitely recommend seeking out some really delicious sunflower. I mean, there are some, some okay ones that are imported as well. Um, and we mm -hmm. carry a couple of the, that we've found that we love, um, but um but yeah, you mentioned that, Bonnie. A lot of people it. can get delivery from you or order from you. So Jesse, <laughs> give a little shout out quick to your website while you're here. Yeah, uh, yeah, we're, we've done all sorts of you know pivoting <laughs> this, this, <laughs> this year. So um, I'm adding the duck to the onions that are um, sauteing. Great. Um, and are we looking like, to caramelize them or just soften yeah. them? Like, where are we going for here? Yeah, I mean, you want to get a little color. I always like to use the term, I, I went a little bit less here just to, for the sake of time, but I usually try to let people go a little bit more. But I love okay. um, the term hard fried because um, that's kind of how, like, my mom, who's not a trained chef, um, she, um, she doesn't know to caramelize an onion takes like 30, 40 minutes and doing this slow. Oh my gosh. Slow. Right, right, right. It's but like washing actually, the paint dry. 
even though it's right? so worth it's it, so it but tight. still <laughs> it's so worth it right but then what I realized actually is that there's like there's actually some beauty to not doing it correctly and to you know having the heat a little too high and having the outside really bright like dark brown and like caramelization on just the surface while the inside of the onion is still almost white and I call that hard fried um, and to me that flavor of a caramelized onion is the flavor of my childhood because that's like how my mom and I think a lot of you know moms yes do it. first of all Bonnie you know we spoke about this before you've got two kids I've got six kids and to sit there and caramelize as much as I would love to right. is not always in the schedule and yeah. I didn't actually know there was a term for when I quickly char and burn the outside almost but the inside's still white so did you coin the term hard fried yeah, like I can I steal that it that what's the story you can totally take it <laughs> it might already exist and I just don't know it but that's what I call it so, right. But that's like when the mom's cooking at home, and if we're trying to yeah. capture the food of our youth, you know, that, that's how we do it. <laughs> Hard fry. So that matzo meal that was sitting and soaking, I just uh, threw my my sautéed duck and onion into it, mm. and mix I'm mixing it all up. And once it's cold, and what's the ratio, and, Bonnie, of the matzo meal to the water yeah, in terms yeah. of soaking it? So here I'm doing a small batch. So I have a cup of matzo meal, a half and a cup and a half, excuse me, of water um uh, so that's um and then to that excuse me the onion is a quarter of an onion and then i just had that one uh duck leg but yeah i was just so more forgiving. interested in, in the water to the matzo meal like i, I yeah. so i've never uh, you know played around with matzo meal in that way so this is exciting to me um yeah i uh i'm trying to think i feel like that's the only situation that oh you know what my mom makes a matzo kugel where she always soaks the um she always soaks the uh matzo but crackers not the meal she soaks right. it before she makes the kugel so like that's kind of there's some soaking happening i've seen right. it before um now yeah i'm saying when i do a matzo second. ball i add the water but i don't soak it so or you know right, the right. seltzer so yeah okay so you've added one egg so i added an egg and i, I just made, i mean i could have added it sooner it's more just that you know you're hot chicken and or yeah. not chicken duck uh, <laughs> and you want to give it a second to cool so mixing it together and letting the temperature go down a little um, and then I've got some duck fat um, it's you know nice and white and firm when it's cold but if you let it sit at room yeah. temperature it becomes fluid so it's a lot easier to mix that way um, so there's that and then and I see a scallion hanging out on the edge of your uh, <laughs> cutting board. I'm excited to see what we're doing with that. <laughs> uh, I'm just gonna, it's just for garnish. No whipping okay. or anything like that. <laughs> okay. I always say like never underestimate the power of a little green, you know, at the end, like you just put a little yeah. green on anything and it's like, boom, you've served something yeah. beautiful. Okay. So I'm just going to grab another pan and I have some more duck fat hanging out. And so here's just something else to note, like, this consistency will firm up when it sits in the refrigerator. So what I actually okay. like to do, typically, and we, we're gonna make this now, we're gonna spoon it in and it's gonna be delicious. Um, but what I like to do when I'm preparing for a large group and like when we're making, you know, we're doing um, Seder boxes at the restaurant, you know, for 200 people, um, 250. So, um, you know, for that, we're, we have this batter and it sits and it gets cold and then you can shake it with your hands really easily. Um, and then you have them all when I'm laid shaping out matzo cook. balls, Bonnie. I, I need to often like put a little bit of water, a little bit of oil mm -hmm. on my hands because it's sticky. Do you have the same issue with this batter? Totally. Yeah. So if I was going to wait and let it firm up, I would want to do that here. I'm going to just, I'm going to actually just spoon this in like I would lock it I'll just batter. drop it in. Yeah. Um, just, fabulous. Again, for the sake of time and not wanting to turn this into a whole thing, we're just going to do this quick, quick and dirty. <laughs> um, so, and it's at the end of the end of the day, it's the same flavor. It's the same, everything, same texture. It's just a matter of not right. wanting to take the time. So I'm putting some more duck fat. Um, you can use anything to fry in. I love, I love being able to really bring the duckiness through at every yeah. level here. Um, so that's why I, I see that, that. <laughs> <laughs> in this particular situation, get a little bit more in there. Um, so, Bonnie, is this on the menu year-round, or is this just a special Passover dish? This is just for Passover. Um, we, you know, we're not, a, we're not a Jewish restaurant, and um, so a, a few years in, I started to realize that I was kind of missing the opportunity to be able to share that part of my heritage, and it happened to be somebody uh, came to me with the idea to... Um, um, to do a uh, Seder meal uh -huh. um, with 
for this like it was like a this really cool lodge in the middle of nowhere in Oregon in the forest. Um, beautiful. And so I thought that'd be such a great, it's a good opportunity to go to hang out in nature. And, um, so, but I really had this opportunity to think through like, well, if Kachka did a Seder, what would that be like? And I loved that opportunity, that like sort of exercise to see what I would do. And um, I ended up loving it so much that we started doing that every year as like a big communal Seder. Wow. Um, and now that we're in, in the land of COVID, um, we were so sad that we weren't able to continue that tradition this year or and last year. So um, yeah. right right at the start of all of this, you know, was Passover. And so we pretty quickly were like, oh my God, what are we gonna do? We have to cancel the Seder. We made these boxes. So anyway, um, we've been we've been figuring it out. And it's actually in yeah. some ways nice because you know, la last year, for example, was right at the beginning of everything, and we'd have beautiful stories like you know, um, three different generations of the same family come through and pick up their box. They were all going to have a Zoom Seder together and they wanted to share yes. our meal together. And just like really beautiful stories that we got to to learn about. So what's the Jewish nice. community like in Portland, Oregon? Um, it's it's a, a storied community, um, you know, been ingrained in Portland, you know, for a long, long, long time. Um, I moved here 10 years ago, so I'm not super, super, oh, like, I don't want to misspeak about the history and all that because I'm not, that's not. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, for sure. But I'm just but, wondering, is it small? Is it large? You know, that kind of thing. I mean, I would say it's small, but mighty. Um, yeah. I, I, our, the synagogue we belong to um, is right in the center of downtown Portland. It's this beautiful historic temple and you know it's it has so much history and love and um yeah. i just i love it and i think i saw on your instagram feed and i don't know if this is still true or how recent it is that you put the afi komen on your menu like year round is that like real and i love what you did to the afi komen <laughs> it never looked and sounded so delicious that's not it's just for passover as well but okay. um you know i obviously it's not it's not how it should be i mean you should have to be have your last bite of matzah be just matzah but um i like the idea of treating it like dessert since it's supposed to be the end the last thing you taste yes um yes. so yeah we did this sort of like cr uh, like a crunch with cocoa nibs and sour cherries and hazelnuts and um it's it's craveable <laughs> you know? yes it sounds it okay so what are we looking for in our crumbs of luck like light brown dark brown yeah so hold on I have to do this on camera while everyone's watching. Um, I know. Forget about it. You're like, you want to say to people, I really do know how to cook. It's just totally different when everyone's like things. Um, yeah. So I'm shallow frying them here. Like you can see nice active bubbles. I'm keeping my heat moderate. Um, nice golden, even color. And we're going to want that on the other side too. And that's really what you're going for. Pretty straightforward. Right. And how are we going to drain this after? You have like a paper towel oh. line pan or a cook? I don't know yeah. if you can Talk see if this is on camera, but uh, yeah, it looks yeah. good. So yeah, I use um, uh, just a rack with a sheet tray um, and everything will come yeah. dripping through. That doesn't want to hang on. Um, and so we'll do that for the sake of time, just because I'm going to, like if it was just, again, if I was doing this for a group and I'm going to heat them up later, which, you know, by the way, another thing that's great about this is because there's so much uh, beautiful duck fat in there, um, it's so flavorful and rich that when you, if you do this ahead and then pop it in the oven, uh, like I love up on a rack like this, um, put it yes. back in the oven at a high temperature um, to reheat, it'll still re-crisp. And so it actually is such a perfect cook ahead um item because it feel like something crispy like this it seems like something you would have to make a la minute and you actually don't um so anyway if i if i'm gonna since i'm gonna like eat it now um i i'll lay a paper towel down so it has something quick to drain on yeah um but that's but a yeah. great tip you a great great tip because people are always always asking it comes up with lot on hanukkah time with the latkes and right. it's like obviously there's nothing so good about you know nothing like a latke straight out of the pan but i love that this has a little bit more legs and have the ability to reheat in a different kind of way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If I treated if treated well, just like a lock, uh, yeah, it's obviously a hundred percent when it's straight out of the pan. <laughs> but I'd say it's like ninety eight percent there reheated. You don't really lose that much. Um, Amazing. So yeah. So I mean, the only other thing here is, I mean, I'm gonna say I know. It's not what you want to hear, but I always eat these with sour cream. Um, yeah, body, no, the, no. But well, we can do, you know, I, 
I know a well, Russian tradition is like sour cream and everything um, yeah. and like cream and caviar. Um, but I love, first of all, there are lots of non-dairy, you know, sour creams out there, you know, right. for a kosher kitchen. And let's yeah. just say you are doing a non-dairy version. Can you give me any other suggestions for topping? You know, like uh, horseradish, is that something that could go with this or? Absolutely. I'm just throwing absolutely. an idea out there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Horseradish, any sort of a, uh, like, uh, uh, pesto of some sort, like uh, ah, I would I like love that idea. to see this with like a pea pea stew or something like that, like uh -huh. other like spring vegetable mash essentially turn right. into a sauce, like a bunch of herbs in there. Right. Um, yeah, I feel like it could do really with well with herbs, herbs be because of the duck fat. Like I feel like the yeah. herbs in these something a little bit bright, you know? Yeah, exactly. So you can I, I wouldn't necessarily reach for basil. So when I say pesto, I don't necessarily mean that in the Correct. very traditional sense. But yeah, any herb, I mean parsley would be amazing here. Um and right. yeah, like any I, I love rhubarb this time of year. In fact, like I, you know, Ashkenazi background. So our harosa is always apples uh, in my mom's yeah. in my mom's kitchen um since mm -hmm. i've taken over seders it's always rhubarb because for me apples are just not what they should be this time of year and so i always recommend in general like think of rhubarb as the like seder apple you know like it's that crunchy tart fresh fruit um so in the, like you could put like a rhubarb corroset with this and it would be delicious uh, first of all chef bonnie i am obsessed with that idea and i was just on clubhouse i don't know if you've gotten on the app lately we were talking about corosets from around the world and how like there's very there's indian inspired corosets there's very sparty corosets which are very date um, rich and kind of like a spread or a preserves mm -hmm. mine was always apple but this rhubarb is like really genius i love yeah, it yeah you should you should try it. Um, you know, a lot of people are surprised to find out that rhubarb is just delicious raw. I think um, the yeah. assumption is that you have to cook it and you actually don't. Um, mm -hmm. And I like to do a mix. I'll do like, I'll make like a rhubarb butter and then I will dice up fresh rhubarb or pickle it and then mix the two together. And it makes a sort of sweet, savory, crunchy, sweet mortar. <laughs> Sounds stunning. And I feel like you're probably like pickling queen. Like I feel like so much of the pickles and the smoked fish is very, very Russian. Is that correct? It's very, very true. Pickling queen. I should make that my new title. <laughs> Forget can you that. hold that pickling a little queen. closer? Totally. Yeah. We'll hold this to the camera so people can see. Yep. Wow. Yeah. Oh There's my gosh. Delicious it's ducky goodness. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't have to be with duck. Obviously we're actually doing a vegetarian version with roasted turnips. Um, Great. That I that is phenomenal. So we can obviously go uh -huh. vegetarian. Um, <clears throat> what about I mean, mushroom in there? Oh like, my god! Is... Absolutely mushroom. Okay. Um, chicken. If you're like, if for some reason duck yes. is like either in a in accessible to you or you're just that's too weird. Um, mm -hmm. Chicken is an easy sub as well with schmaltz. Amazing, amazing. So if you want to just pull up the chair, maybe we'll reposition the camera so we get a little closer yeah. to you. We have just a few minutes left and I want people to learn about your story. Um, the introduction to your book is stunning, Bonnie. I like was chills Thank all you. over my body when I heard the why of Kachka. So um, let's see if we can get you closer. Israel can even take a moment you, and bring the camera closer can bring the, if we can. The rod down. Yeah, the pull down. I think he's working on it. We can start talking. Yeah, yeah I see. And <laughs> tell me what you're drinking. Um, I'm having some green tea, some sencha. Oh, stop. I was going to have green tea and I was literally thinking sencha. And then I'm like, I did green tea two weeks ago. So I'm going to do, I'm actually doing tea with nana. So in nana in Hebrew is mint. And I brought oh. in some fresh mint leaves that I'm going to actually add to it. Like every tea you get in Israel when you order at the end of the meal is like hot water with tons of fresh yes. mint leaves. And then you could add tea bags if you wanted to. That sounds so. delicious. You know, I almost reached for the peppermint myself because that's my that's my my go to tea. So we're, we're yeah. vibing. <laughs> OK, we're on the same wavelength. So you must tell everyone, um, Bonnie, the name, the origin of the name Kachka. Yeah, um, so my family um, is from Belarus. At the time, it was the Soviet Union when they left, but I was born here. And my dad, uh, we would always go for walks in the evening. And my dad would tell me stories of my grandparents who I never got to meet because they passed away when I was four, but they were still in the Soviet Union. So unfortunately, mm -hmm. we never got to meet. But his parents, um, I would always hear stories about them from him. And one of the ones that I like most latched onto was this story about my grandmother. She 
um, escaped from the a ghetto um, in the middle of the night. She left behind her family because they, her parents were getting on in years and they said, if we all go, we'll get caught, you go yourself. She left in the middle of the night with her three month old child in her arms and just headed, um, she's in Belarus at this time. So she just headed east towards Russia um and uh just going through the forest and this is october and like one of the coldest months or coldest years on record um and she ends up burying her son along the way um barely making it she ends up um along along her route um she comes up against uh Stadistia, which is like it translates to kind of like town warden who was appointed by the germans um and he's you know accusing her you're a jew you know and he's taking it and and she's like, no, 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 I'm Ukrainian. And for understanding there, um, the complexion of an average Ukrainian is a little bit darker. Um, so you can kind of say, you know, that's who I am instead of, because uh, in Belarus, the non-Jews were very different looking, very pale. Anyway, so she's saying, no, no, I'm Ukrainian, I'm Ukrainian. And he said, oh yeah, if you're Ukrainian, how do you say duck in Ukrainian? In Russian, it's Utka. So he would have been talking to her in Russian and asking in Russian. And she obviously has no idea. She doesn't know a word of Ukrainian. She knows Yiddish and she knows a little bit of Belarusian. So she hopes that some of the words overlap. So she says Kachka. And he lets her go because it actually is the right word. Um, it turns out that um, it's the word for duck in pretty much every language around Russia, except for Russia. It's like Polish, uh, Belarusian, Ukrainian, and Yiddish, you know, it's all Kachka. So luckily that was her magic word. And he, she ended up fighting with the partisans uh, in Russia. Um, and uh, she's my personal hero. <laughs> So I've not, wow. I never got to meet her, but um, that story to me is like my my personal. Every, I mean, this story is unique to my family, but it's like when you talk to other um, survivors or families of survivors, you hear so many similar stories. So much luck and just just bravery too. And um, so for me, this is my personal story, and I I love how it. Um, you know, connects me also to others. But um, whenever something is like not going well or pretty rough, I first of all, I'm like, what are you talking about? There's nothing in comparison. And then, you know, <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> but also that like she, you know, like anytime anything is tough, and I'm like, you know, she buried a child in the forest. And instead of just like laying down and dying, she could just like keep going. And that yeah. to me is like the most brave, heroic thing you could do. So um to me, that's the one word that like best represents my my story, my family story. And that's that's why we went with that. I feel that it's a story of the survival of your family, but it's the greater story of the survival of the Jewish people. And yeah. I know that you said that your cooking wasn't necessarily the restaurant, it's not necessarily a Jewish restaurant, but so much of the Russian cuisine is your personal, you know, culture, heritage, and the food that you grew up with. Is there, I, I feel like I have to imagine there's some level of spiritual component to your cooking, just by the way you named your restaurant. Um, but talk to me a little bit about what cooking means to you. There's, it's not just about, I imagine, um, you know, survival, just eating and making and making it to another day. But I, it seems to be about so much more for you. Yes. Um, you know, it's, I have trouble cooking without a story or a background. I have trouble making any dish without it having some sort of a reason for existing. Um, so, you know, that to me is, is why we cook, why I cook. Um, you know, I often uh, like to share with people when I, when I talk about like, like running a restaurant um, that I know when we opened the restaurant, we had this bigger goal of like wanting to share this cuisine with people, but one of the things I never thought could happen or would happen, it wouldn't even have crossed my mind, is, you know, having a diner crying over their bowl of golubtsi, cabbage rolls, because the flavor of that particular bowl of cabbage rolls was identical to how their grandmother made them and their grandmother's past and their mother never carried on a tradition. And so this is like this like surviving memory that it brought back of their grandmother, you know? And so those yeah. sorts of things, that's like, that's what keeps me going. And that's my, like, that's my spiritual compass. It's like, I just want people to be able to connect with their heritage. Um, yeah. And this cuisine is so underrepresented um, in the United States that 
Um, it feels sometimes like if I don't do this, then it might not just, it might not be done. That opportunity for that person to be crying into their bowl of galipsy might never have happened. <laughs> um, and that, that, that's enough. Cause you know, a lot of the times in a restaurant, it's uh, hard to find reason to keep going. <laughs> Yeah, I can imagine it's not an easy industry, that's for sure. I think we know that, and certainly now, um, you know, given the state of the world, I imagine the challenges are so, so great. But I have to tell you, I wanted to message 100 people that I know that would appreciate your food and your cooking, because it does feel so underrepresented. And I thought it interesting reading your bio to see all of your accolades and that you did study, you know, um, you know, French cooking and cuisine, etc. Yet you found your way home. So what was the journey? Journey for you in terms of going like super classic, like trained chef, culinary, you know, French cuisine, blah, 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 to really bringing it back home. Like, was that what, what was the why behind that? And how did that bring you home? Um, yeah, the, the why I blame my husband. Um, yeah, <laughs> I do all the time for everything. I agree. I agree. <laughs> yeah. Oh, when Israel. We, when, yeah. <laughs> when we uh, were dating, we were working in a restaurant together. I respect his opinion about food more than anybody else. He has the best palate I know. Um, super, super well-rounded cook. And um, he he actually went to culinary school so that he could better understand how to manage a dining room. Like he's so invested and so good at what he does. Um, and anyway, so we were working together at this really, really high-end, well-known restaurant in Chicago. And he, um, you know, it was time to bring him home to meet the parents. And um, I, I told him, I warned him that like, just so you know, like this, the food you're going to have here is going to be a little weird. You're not going to like it. It's, you know, just, just words of the wise. And he, and what was it? Like, just say specifically, like, what was the spread like that you were like, you know, preparing him for that, for that reaction as weird? I mean, something like haladiets, for example, which is like um, meat jelly, essentially, like cold <laughs> meat jelly, um, herring under fur coat, um, lots of <laughs> lots of pickles of things that are besides cucumbers, you know, just um, saw, uh, you know, like the gefilte fish even with like my mom even makes it year round just and just make it for Jewish holidays. So everything you can imagine. Um, that I, I think for, and the general idea in a Russian household is the most of the food is for zakuski, for the beginning of the meal. And so um, it's just walking in and seeing just like a table full of like 20 different little bites of things that look super foreign, um, I mm -hmm. think is just really intimidating. And then also there's the drinking component. And so wanting to make sure that he was prepared to not feel intimidated if my uncle tries to like, <laughs> get him to because oh yeah and that, that's the other thing too it happened to be like a little bit more than just my parents it was like a little bit of a bigger family dinner that I set him up <laughs> for um anyway he left that night blown away and told me that that was like the best meal he had ever had and just all he wanted wow. was more of that and so that sort of attitude was like first of all like at first I thought he was just like saying that to you know suck up to my mother and to me or yeah. whatever but <laughs> he he really meant it and and my mom started to get really excited about the food because you know she saw somebody who was excited about something that you know no one else in our family including herself was excited about for a long time and right. so it yeah. kind of like reinvigorated her she started like um inviting us over for meals because she's like oh yes i made this i made something that you know i ha we haven't had since we left belarus and you know so that was really exciting for her and so we all just kind of started talking about that food more and that's how we got into this whole thing because, you know, he was so excited and made me realize like, wait a minute, this food that I kind of at best took for granted, but at most was embarrassed yeah. by, yes, um, yes. you know, I went from that to kind of being like, well, wait, maybe I'm the crazy one. Maybe there's nothing to be embarrassed about and I need to, you know, own, own it a little bit more. So yeah. without that, I never would have got gone there. And, you know, and ever since that it's been our, our goal and our, our, purpose to just share the food with others and that's important to me it's it's been really interesting you bring up french cuisine it's been really interesting working and training others in this kitchen how many times i have to be like no no you actually want to cook the carrots all the way like they need to be boiled until they're like baby food you know? <laughs> so, like, they're, sure so they're like dead <laughs> yeah you know like there's like a lot of things like that where if you're classically trained french chef you're like wait i i'm not supposed to do it this way you yeah. know, caramelized onions versus hard fried onions, you know, things like that, where yeah. I have to like 
come up with other words for things because it doesn't really exist. Um, even though it's been existing for centuries, it's just not in this world. Um, and so that's been kind of a challenge in some ways. And, and sometimes like I've heard, I've had uh, some cooks, you know, leave after working for us for a year saying, you know what, I just, I need to work in a French kitchen. I'm like, oh, ouch, you know, like why? What do you, yeah. what makes you think that that's gonna, that's, that's the preferred, but that's, that thankfully that's rare, you know, and a lot of people come to us yeah. because they want to learn more about this food. Um, right. But that's still an ongoing thing is that this sort of like, why is, why is French the dominant, um, the dominant cuisine? And also if you actually think about French history, um, most of the best French chefs in the 1800s were actually cooking at Russian courts. And a lot of the things that they brought back yes. to France were actually Russian. So, so you know, it's, it's so fascinating to me. Yeah, I so connect to what you were saying about being embarrassed uh, about the food. You know, I grew up in a suburb of Philadelphia, very, very Jewish, but very American. So as, as you know, daughter to immigrant parents, you know, my father, even though, you know, many years he'd been in America, but I always say he sounds like he just got off the boat yesterday. Like, you know, people have trouble understanding him. And yeah. so uh, Hungarian, Romanian, they were from Transylvania. And I remember a girl came over and my mother and grandmother were serving turpusui, which is like a pureed bean dip which it's mm -hmm. so humble, right? It's just like puree beans and you take a hunk of bread and you rip it off and you kind of like sop it up and eat it like that. And I was oh, like so God. embarrassed. And she like literally after that, she couldn't get enough. We finished the bowl and then she asked her mom to get the recipe. And that was the beginning of me feeling like, wow, you know, there is something to our special foods and our special history, culture, backgrounds. And uh, this is the last question for you because we're coming up on time here now. How has... Um, cooking in this restaurant and your and your family story and your cookbook connected you more to your Judaism because I loved hearing that like it was upon request that you started with the Seder you know menu and now you have the Seder boxes and the afikoman is the just you made it into a dessert so just give me a little bit of a connection you know to to your not just um geographical heritage right but like the religion as well or your spirituality or Judaism however you connect yeah, that's a great question. I mean, yeah, it is It is something that I tried to keep separate for a long time. I felt like it was muddying the message. And I realized after doing a few of those seders that like, you know, this is actually a really part of my experience as a Soviet Jewish immigrant. You know, like that's a very specific experience. And in fact, um, a lot of the dishes that I know to be the way that it's done, you know, um, it turns out is really the Russian Jewish way it's done. And yes. that somebody who lived in the same country, maybe even next door to my parents who pra practiced Christianity would have done completely differently because of the sort of uh, the cultural component to that um, religion. Yes. And so um, that to me just makes me want to own it more. Um, and the other thing, unfortunately, that's happened recently is um, some anti-Semitism uh, about no. two years ago now. Um, we were, um, our bar um, had an incident where um, somebody carved a swastika into our mirror um, in the bathroom. And then there was a copycat who did it on the wall. It was a whole thing. And the police, unfortunately, were not very helpful. And anyway, wow. it was so, it like shook me to my core. And it felt, I felt very seen in a bad way because clearly it was targeted. Um, and, um, you know, and nobody really felt, you know, from an a, from a authority side of things, didn't feel like they needed to do anything about it. And so it made me feel even more, like it was more important to be loud and proud and to make yeah. sure to not sort of compartmentalize that. Um, and so I, I can't say there's like a specific pathway and like purpose and that I have like a mission, but it's like, I make a point to not separate, oh, well, that's a Jewish dish. So we're not going to do that at Kachka. You know, right. like I, I, I try to mix it up and keep it like my, my grandmother uh, makes Teglik, which are those like little cookies yes. and honey. Yes. Um, and like last year we did that for a special event that was like totally not related to anything. I was like, I just want to make Teglik for this. I think it's totally appropriate. Um, yeah. and so there's just a lot of that. And I love, I love share and like, I, I get to educate my staff and, um, the community who, you know, is willing to listen. So mm -hmm. I've just really enjoyed, um, just learning through that. And as far as the spirituality side of it goes, you know, I'm not particularly spiritual, but my, my spirituality is cooking, you know, and that's how, yeah, I, for I, sure. I, so like when I'm in there and I'm learning and thinking about it and thinking about, 
my my journey and my family like that's how i connect my spirituality and so for me that's just personally really important I, I love speaking with you chef bonnie morales i knew that i would uh i cannot wait to get my hands on your book uh, i think it's tremendous that you're basically salvaging this cuisine um you know on behalf of the entire united states really giving everyone a a feel and a flavor and a taste of what the russian cuisine is and also a flavor and a taste for the Jewish Russian experience all the way back to why the why the book and why the restaurant is named Kachka to begin with if you're just tuning in now you must you know scroll back a little bit and hear that story and also the way that you brought the Seder and Judaism through your restaurant to Portland Oregon which I think is unbelievable and so I wish you so much success and I I'm so impressed with your reaction to that what happened in terms of um, the swastika and the anti-semitism now you just leaned into it and owned it in such a proud way. Um, you're an inspiration to all of us and I want to thank you and I want to thank Israel from behind the camera and the front of the house and everything and I want to wish you a happy Passover. Thank you so much. Thank Anna. you so much, Jamie. It's such a, such a pleasure. Thanks. Okay. Oh, good. I'm so happy to see. I was going to say, Adam, why aren't you putting up all the comments? I want to see what people are saying. Um, I want to know that you enjoyed this. So oh, thank you, Joel. I'm so happy that you enjoyed. Um, I want to also hear from you. Hi, April. Um, the types of food that you want to see, the type of stories you want us to capture. You know, this is Feed Your Soul. And the idea here is that food is so much more than sustenance, right? And we're talking about soul food and Jewish soul food from all over the world and it's the one thing that can really bring us together and help us inspire each other and have meaningful conversations around the table so we've gone super over is that rabbi berg who just commented yay rabbi berg i hope you're watching um unless there's another steven berg out there which you know it's a common name i guess um and hi for, hi in france how are you i want to wish everyone a chag kasher v'sameach a happy healthy Passover, in Yiddish we say Zis and Pesach, a sweet Passover. Health goes without saying, um, wherever you are in the world, I hope that you're able to celebrate it with some level of family, whether it's your nuclear family or beyond. And until we'll take a week off for Passover, I try not to work during the holiday, unless it's an emergency. And as much as I think the show is important, I don't think it's like a dire emergency. So we shall come back with new episodes after. Thank you for watching. Thank you for eating. Thank you for enjoying. Thank you for commenting. Thank you for making the recipe I hope you're making them, so I'm thanking you in advance for that, and happy Passover.